We don't have we don't have um, fixed distances um, between wind turbines and um, settlements. Um, no, it's it's um, sometimes there are, but yeah, there is no federal um, regulation um, for the distance between wind turbines and settlements. Many many people don't know that. Even Germans don't know that. So you could put one a hundred feet from someone's house. No. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And I'm Rosemary Barnes. And this is the Uptime Podcast, bringing you the latest in wind energy tech, news, and policy. Hello, and welcome back to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's show, we've got a great friend of Uptime guest, Julia Wolf, will be joining us. And she is a senior project manager for wind acquisition uh, with the Jewy Group out of Germany. She also runs her own podcast called Wind Canal, which means wind channel in German. It's a German language podcast. And one of her goals uh, as a, a passionate wind energy expert is to educate the public, which is part of her job uh, with the Jewy Group. So she goes... Um, into communities to help people understand what to expect as you know they propose new plans to bring more and more wind energy to Germany. So in that task, she started doing her podcast to help answer some of these questions on a larger scale to help people understand, you know, demystify some of the things and just really wrap their heads around in, in simple, you know, layman terminology, you know, what's going to be going on, what are the benefits of wind energy, and to allay some of their fears and concerns. So we're really happy to have her check out her interview in about 15 minutes. Uh, the rest of the show, we're going to talk about France. We're going to talk about Germany some more. We're going to talk about United States policy, nuclear, battery tech, all that. So stay tuned. We've got a great show. Before we get going, be sure to subscribe to the Uptime Tech News. That's our weekly newsletter. So if you want to get updates on the show, along with other great news from around the web, definitely sign up below. You'll find that in the show notes. And of course, grab a subscription to Rosemary's YouTube channel. She continues to put out great renewable energy content. You'll also find that in the description. All right, so let's jump right in. So France, they've announced that they're going to build up to 14 new nuclear reactors by 2050. Uh, obviously, this is a kind of a controversial topic because some countries are exiting nuclear, but France is kind of doubling down. So Alan, what do you think the reason is for this move by uh, Macron and France? Well, I, I think France has had a big push against some renewables, uh, particularly solar and wind in the sense that uh, it it muddies up the beautiful landscape that is France. And I got to admit, France is very beautiful. And so what they've decided to do is to try to uh, do another renewable, quote unquote, renewable, which is, is nuclear. I, I think that makes sense for France. And I, obviously, France has been a leader in nuclear energy for a long period of time. But all the neighbors around France are not big Opponents of nuclear energy, particularly Germany, which is now shutting down all their nuclear power plants. And the government of Germany is, is headed in a direction of being anti-nuclear, has been for a while. The, the issue between France and Germany is if, if France has a nuclear meltdown, all the radioactive material will blow over Germany. And that's why Germans are very concerned about this uh, latest move from France. That all makes sense, but I, I I think there has to be some sort of middle ground. And and Rosemary, do, I know in Australia that you, you have also a, essentially an anti nuclear stance. Do you think because of the push for renewables and, and that nuclear is going to be an option in Australia like it is in France? Um, it's it's an interesting time because now we've got this nuclear sub uh, agreement. So it is pretty weird that we would have a fleet of nuclear submarines and no domestic <laughs> nuclear capabilities other than for research and medicine. Um, I personally don't think that we will get nuclear simply because Australia's energy transition is not um, it, it's not ideologically driven <laughs> in Australia. It's like nearly the opposite. Um, it's, and where you know we've got this incredibly fast energy transition now, simply because wind and solar just they're so economically 
you know, uh, appealing at the moment um, and will only get better. So I'll be really surprised if in Australia we ever end up where nuclear is a fast, cheap way to make renewable energy. I mean, we've already got South Australia with more than 60% wind and solar um, contribution to their electric- electricity grid over the last 12 months for the whole of Australia. It was, um, I think, in the high 20s or somewhere in the maybe even the 30s. So it's kind of happening easily here, you know. Um, I think it's in real contrast to Northern Europe where there's a lot bigger challenges because, you know, they've got this real problem in the mismatch between solar and um, their, you know, peak demand because they need so much heating energy in the um, in the winter and it doesn't correlate well with solar. It's, it's It correlates fine with, with wind, but... It's just a big challenge for them to get to 100% renewables, variable renewables, wind and solar. So um, I would definitely, I don't support nuclear in Australia simply because I don't think that it, it is economically sensible or that it will be the fastest thing. Um, but happy for France to continue with it. I think their biggest challenge will be that all of um, all of EDF's recent projects have, you know, run decades over and billions of dollars over, you know, like sometimes they're ending up tripling their budget by the time they've finished um, the one that they've built in the, or they're building in the UK. Uh, you know, I think they had to guarantee a, a power purchase price of $92 a megawatt hour. It's, you know, it's incredibly expensive. Um, so, yeah, that's the that's the trade off, and hopefully they're they're learning and can improve costs. But the recent um, the recent evidence has not shown that trend. It's shown the opposite. Nuclear power is getting more expensive. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's a few new technologies that uh, have been promised that may change things. Um, but yeah, so far we haven't seen a lot of you know competitive price competitive nuclear projects, and it'll be a big job for for. The, for them to do it. But, you know, France believes in nuclear power and they're putting their money where their mouth is. And and I think it's good that, you know, that someone is. I don't want everyone to do the exact same thing because that's not the fastest way to, you know, arrive at the, the best the best mix. And nuclear power is, is clean um, other than the radioactive waste, which is not, not a problem that I'm massively concerned about because when you look at the data, it's actually, you know, there's small, small numbers of deaths from nuclear, even when you include the big disasters. So... Yeah, happy for France to do it, but I don't think we'll see Australia doing it. Not if they can do it safely. Uh, it may be more money to do, but that's a trade-off they're willing to make. I think that trade-off is going to happen not just in France, but in a lot of different places. Japan probably is going to have a similar issue. There's there's only so much real estate, and you can't fill it all with solar. You can't fill it necessarily all with wind. Maybe offshore wind you can. But at some point, nuclear is going to play a part of this. And with the if everybody's watching the news, there's been a lot of uh, recent breakthroughs in fusion, and I and in it, where it seems like within the next twenty to fifty years, there is a very light, strong likelihood that we could have fusion reactions because they're getting positive outflows of megawatts of power out of some of these short-term fusion things. All, all right now is we're looking at to tie it over. If we can make fission, which is a nuclear reaction, we can do that safely for long enough. Maybe the transition is to get to fusion. We're all just waiting for the next big energy source. We wouldn't have we wouldn't have transitioned to. Uh, you, you could ask anybody, 50, 60 years ago, if solar would be as big as it is right now, and the answer would have been absolutely no. I think the, the preponderance of evidence would have led that way. I think this for a lot of energy sources they develop over time, and if we do get to a fusion future. It's going to be crazy beneficial for the planet. So engineers like Rosemary and me and you know thousands and thousands of others are all working to try to make the environment cleaner and energy less expensive. Those are all good goals to get. And But it's just how we're all going to do it and how each country is going to approach it is going to be widely varying. And I think Rosemary's right. It needs to be because no one's going to have the perfect solution. Moving on, Duke Energy, uh, which is the second largest uh, electric utility here in the U.S., uh, and they're regulated. So obviously they have a lot of, uh, you know, they can recoup their investments, they can earn a profit, uh, but obviously they are heavily regulated by the U.S. here. Uh, so they have announced that they're trying to exit coal completely by 2035 and double their renewable capacity by 2030. Um, Alan, obviously, you know, wind farms are going up here in the U.S. We're making a big push for renewable energy. 
Um, does a company like, or does, does a utility like Duke, do they have to make these choices? Or, I mean, how much leeway does a utility have in deciding, you know, where they put their investments and, and what, how they're going to generate their electricity in the future? I mean, couldn't Duke be all renewables or could they be all fossil fuels? I mean, is there anything in the regulation that says, hey, this is what you should do or shouldn't do? Well, I, I think the regulation, at least in the United States, makes it less uh, efficient, less profitable to have a coal burning power plant. I think the environmental regulations make that so. And Obama talked to President Obama talked about that years ago now, where we're going to make the requirements on coal factories so onerous that, that no one will open one. We don't have to ban them. We just have to make it very difficult. Well, that that happened. And, and so what's happened? What the the energy industry is doing is adjusting to the environment in which they're in. If you if you essentially ban a form of energy like fracking, as it's happening in New York State and some other places, the energy company has to, have to do something else. And Duke Energy's been a leader in renewable energy. They they have a, a massive amounts of renewable energy right now. I, I think they're just going to have to continue to push down that line of finding new sources of energy to keep up with the, the growth. They're, they're in the really sweet spot in the United States too, Rosemary. They're in North Carolina, South Carolina, where there's just tons of, well, a lot of people are moving to those areas now. So the population increase is going to be substantial. So they have a little bit of a quasi crisis on their hands that the demand for electricity in those areas is going to be jumping up and up. And the, the, the sources that they have right now are becoming offline do you see this at some point? There's just a, a juncture point where uh, the, the usage, demand, and, and the ability to create the energy is just going to reach a nexus where it may be difficult to do that in the next five to 10 years? Well, I don't know about in the, the U.S. specifically and how yeah, demographics are changing, people are moving around the country, but I can relate to in, in Australia, coal plants, plants are also closing and people keep on announcing that they're going to close earlier than they had expected to. But everyone in the industry considers it a really open secret that coal plants are going to close much earlier than we think, simply because, not because of intervention from the government. I mean, the Australian government is definitely not going out of their way to make it hard for, for coal or, or gas projects, um, but just because of the, the economics and the technology as well. So once you get a lot of variable renewables in the, in the grid, so solar, for example, you know, you see persistently low prices in the middle of the day when there's a lot of solar and in Australia, we've had like really consistently negative prices nearly every day um, when there's, you know, the most um, solar online. Um, and then there's the evening peak, you know, 5, 6, 7 p.m. A coal power plant can't ramp up fast enough that they can be off to avoid paying the negative prices and then on to take advantage of the high prices at 6 p.m. So they're forced to absorb, like pay to generate in the, um, you know, the middle of the day when there's too much electricity in the grid. Um, and so that they can take advantage of the, the evenings. And then they're also pushing the plants beyond what they were intended to be designed to operate, these old ones at least. You know, they're intended to provide baseload power, very, very constant. Um, and now they're trying to ramp them up and down more than they were probably intended to do. And so you're seeing a lot more um, unplanned um, maintenance that's required. And every now and then you get some unplanned maintenance and they find out that it's going to cost more to fix it than they expect to make from the plant in the rest of its lifetime. So, you know, the, the sensible, economically sensible thing to do if you own that plant is to just close it. And so we're seeing that happen quite quite quickly, I think, in Australia. But I think anyone that has a lot of uh, variable renewables is going to start to see the same things. The uh, coal power plant is just not suited to the modern grid, which has, you know, very variable supply and also very variable demand. And so what you really, you know, there's a real premium on is um, flexibility, which Coal doesn't have, nuclear traditionally hasn't had, though there are some some ways to get a bit more flexibility out of both technologies if you really try. But I, I really think that, um, yeah, the future is with flexible flexible generation. So for now, that's going to mean more gas. And increasingly in the future, it's going to mean more renewable storage. So batteries, and I think we'll see a lot more pumped hydro as well. All right. Well, Julia, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're excited to chat with you today. Thanks for the invitation, Dan. 
Yeah. So obviously, you know, you are an experienced podcaster and we're excited to have someone else who is in our industry, you know, podcasting on <laughs> wind energy because it really is still an underserved market. Uh, part of the reason we got into it, you know, two years ago. Um, and obviously with Al and I being here in the U.S. and our other co-host, uh, Rosemary, being in Australia, we figured picking your brain about Germany and uh, some of the other goings ons out in Europe would be would be great. So I think the first thing we want to kind of cover is. Um, you know, in Germany, you're doing feed in tariffs and they're pretty high and, you know, they've been put in place to help get renewable energy established. Um, and we haven't done that in the U S and it's, you know, I think that system varies, but how has the feed in tariff system been going? Do you feel like it's going to prove to be a big success long-term? Uh, yeah, we've had the feed in tariff for quite a long time right now. Um, I think it all started about 20 years ago when we got a, um, a renewable energy act and, um, yeah, we get guaranteed feed-in tariffs for any renewable energy. They are different according to solar PV, biogas, wind, and so on. Um, and they, yeah, they change each year, let's say, um, for quite a long time, we had, a we had fixed, tariffs um, that were decreasing every three months. So, but at any time uh, you knew, so if I um, switch on my wind turbine on 1st of October in uh, uh, 2017, I will get uh, don't know, seven cents per kilowatt hour. Yeah. And, um, but uh, a few years ago they changed that system and now we have uh, bidding rounds, so uh, tenders where we have to bid for with our uh, permissions for solar PV and, and wind, for example. And um, yeah, if we if we win, um, then we get um, this tariff for the next twenty years. And um, yeah, and as I heard, uh, our tariffs are quite a lot higher than yours in the US. Yeah, Alan, do we have a system of feed-in tariffs at all in the U.S.? No, it's a everything floats. Uh, well, then there's two different ways it goes about right now, right? There's there's the energy day-to-day -day energy market that happens, and the pricing varies day-to-day. -day. But there's also, as we're seeing more and more companies try to to buy offsets, that they're buying it at a fixed price. So the wind farm is developed knowing they're going to get a fixed price from Facebook or Google or Apple or somebody, and they're selling energy at that price. Uh, so it really helps. It's basically the same thing that Germany has, and that's what the model is, but it's not so much government or, local or regionally controlled in the U.S. It tends to be uh, big corporations that are driving some of those stability markets, which is I, I think is really key. There's uh, interesting discussion in, in the Boston newspaper today about the energy prices in America, uh, and particularly in the Northeast, where they've uh, the, the the way they've just constructed the energy prices in the Northeast for the, the next two years are going to make it very difficult for large wind and solar projects to connect to the grid. <laughs> and I think that seems like the opposite of what's happening in Germany right now. That Germany is being very very proactive in in driving to renewable energy. And, and Julie, maybe, maybe you can discuss some of the things they've done in the last couple of years to, to change the, the laws. What you said about the selling energy to, to companies like Google or Facebook, um, this is about to start in Germany right now, or I think the last one or two years, um, that we have um, yeah, the power purchase agreements. This was uh, quite a new business model because we didn't have to do it because the feed-in tariffs um, guaranteed by the states were yeah quite attractive. And yeah, the other models, PPA, they are uh, getting more and more uh, yeah audience, let's say. And for those who aren't familiar with feed-in tariffs, uh, can you just briefly explain like how that works and, and what's unique about it? In Germany, we have uh, fixed uh, feed-in tariffs um, that are guaranteed by the federal network agency. So um, we have 16 federal states in Germany, and um, normally they have very different uh, legislations. Um, but in this case, we have one agency um, for the whole of Germany to uh, yeah do the regulations for 
grid uh, integration for renewable energies. And this is also the agency that um, yeah puts out the tenders where we can bid for. So and um, we the wind turbine operator gets the feed-in tariff. Well, let's say the real money. Um, from the grid operator and the grid operator gets the money back from the federal network agency. So it basically just helps them, I, I don't know if in the US we'd call it a subsidy, but mm. it just helps them be more price competitive as wind energy is you know, getting stood up essentially. Is that right? Yeah. Well, in Germany, we have a stock exchange um, for uh, electricity and a day-to-day -day market, spot market and so on. Well, and, and the state pays the difference or the delta between um, the stock price and um, the guaranteed tariff. And um, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. But, uh, well, most of the time the feed-in tariff is higher. But we are seeing uh, a huge increase of energy costs right now at the beginning of 2022. 20, uh, so um, sometimes or quite often, uh, uh, the yeah, <laughs> the real energy price is higher than the feed-in tariff. So the state doesn't have to pay. Okay, so sometimes they don't have to kick that in, but it, but it's always there as a, as like a safety net in case they do to make sure these companies are still profitable enough to keep it keep it going. After twenty years of operation, PV parks or wind farms they don't get feed-in tariffs anymore, and um, if they have to finance themselves um, by the stock prices, uh, this can be difficult. Right now, it's a good position because uh, we have high energy prices. But two years ago, um, you got two or three cents per kilowatt hour. Right. Um, so this is quite low. So this often didn't um, was uh, was not enough for um, being economic or e economically feasible. So, and that, that was a sure. point when these, um, uh, these wind farms, which were technically in a very good condition, um, they started to um, get these PPAs. So this was one of the reasons why that came as well. The thing that most Americans are really wondering right now, I think, is there's a reliance on... Uh, Germany to push to renewables, which I think is good. That's really a good thing. But in the meantime, there's this pipeline coming from Russia, which is a very big concern in the United States for a variety of reasons. Does that does the does that energy coming from Russia then hurt the renewables in Germany because there's so much extra energy coming in and natural gas? Does that hurt the electricity prices that are available for renewables? Well, I, I think the whole conflict has uh, quite an influence. Anytime when there are political uh, conflicts, um, with a yeah, in a in a context where there are dependencies between two countries, because well, what we would get from Russia is um, natural gas. Um, well, Germany itself doesn't have lots of uh, uh, nat natural gas. Uh, we use it for heating um, and for the industry. Especially, we have some gas turbines or yeah for for electricity uh, production, but it's only a small part. G Germany has has decided to withdraw from nuclear power at a first step, and this will be completed at the end of twenty twenty three. And um, as a second step, uh, we withdraw from coal. So lots of electricity or heat as well is produced from coal in Germany. And um, the target is uh, 2038 sure. as the latest um, to withdraw completely from coal. So we have um, yeah, the challenge to um, produce all this energy uh, by renewable energies, of course. That's a, that's a, very, large, that's a very large gap, right? It, it, the, the closing of the nuclear power plants in replacing that that's a, that's a large energy source for germany right now isn't it and it is and is that just being supplemented by sort of the natural gas going to be coming from russia or coal is is that the is that the thrust right now and does that then put more pressure on renewables yeah um nuclear power in germany didn't have such a huge um share in the energy production so um I, I think renewable energies almost yeah replaced it. Nevertheless, uh, the the share of 
um, coal-fired production of energy increased. So this is kind of um, yeah difficult to see that um, yeah nuclear power is um, switched off, but CO two emitting coal power is um, increasing. So this has to be uh, yeah <laughs> um, changed quickly. What's what's driving all these changes to happen? So rapidly, I know there's been a number of recent elections. Is is the new government the the the, the driving force in a lot of these changes, from like the nuclear power shutdown and now we're more reliance on coal? Is that just because of the government switch? Yeah, to a huge degree, yes. Um, we have a um, quite a strong green party mm, okay. in Germany. Um, yeah, that was formed in the mid seventies, in the context of the anti nuclear power um, movement, and um, yeah, they are now uh, sure one of the three parties that are forming uh, the government government in in Germany, and uh, the coalition act um, has like a, a red line: um, sustainability, renewable energies, decarbonization as the huge topics um, that have to be yeah uh, fulfilled in the next uh, years so this really got um, gave, gave gave a huge um, push to that and the recent recently in Germany they've actually put some requirements down to help expand renewable energy where and Julia you can explain this better than I can but isn't there a, a land requirement now that the each of the municipal towns, cities needed to devote a certain amount of their land towards renewables? Yeah, there is a new target that says that um, every federal state, every community, every region um, has to provide around 2% of their territory for wind farms. And um, this is, well, they calculated this, this would be enough to uh, produce enough energy or wind energy um, to fulfill the targets. Oh wow, that's it. Seems like a really, really small amount of of land, two percent. But uh, Germany is a fairly large com- country, so that that would be a significant amount of wind turbines, I assume, to to do that. Twelve two uh, percent. It doesn't sound much, but well, that's they. This is the the final figure where really wind turbines have to be built. So you have to take into account a lot of uh, yeah a sure. bigger a bigger territory, <laughs> um, maybe six or eight percent of the country um, that are provided. And because in the timeline, you you always find some birds, some bats, or other things that um, yeah just can prohibit your oh, project. Sh- sure. So yeah, the two percent are the final. The final number, um, but what you also have to take in a, into account is that Germany is a very densely populated country because we're more than eighty million people, um, but on quite a small place, let's say. Yeah, so uh, you, you have you have lots of small villages anywhere. So if you have to. Um, have distances of maybe 800 meters or 1,000 meters from houses, um, this can get really difficult. Yeah, yeah. get tricky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But we don't have, we don't have um, fixed distances um, between wind turbines and um, settlements. Um, no, it's, it's, um, sometimes there are, but yeah, there is no federal um, regulation um, for the distance between wind turbines and settlements. Many, many people don't know that. Even Germans don't know that. So you could put one 100 feet from someone's house? No. <laughs> but it's just all individually regulated in, within like areas or states or, okay. Yeah, because what is what is relevant for the distance is uh, not the sheer distance, but the um, the emissions, especially noise. And if you take, um, well, we have uh, um, noise. noise limits at each different um, category of settlement. And, um, well, if you take one of the the new big wind turbines, maybe a Vestas uh, 162 with a five point something uh, generator, um, you will have difficulties to uh, build them too close to a settlement. Well, or you have to 
um, regulate it down, but well, that's not nice. So yeah, and that makes the projects a little more difficult. Obviously, in the United States, there are vast swaths of land where there's very few people on it. So some of these wind turbines, like in West Texas, uh, there's where there are a lot of wind turbines. There's just not that many people out in these areas, uh, and I think. Germany is going to be a much harder place to develop. And as in your day role, as you work with Ford Developer in Germany, but you are really on the front lines with the the public, with uh, local towns, local mayors, like uh, the citizens. How how uh, what is that like? I, mean, I, can, I can imagine what it's like in the United States, where there is some very vocal opposition to wind turbines, and and rightly so. We need to figure that out. Is is there still a lot of vocal oppositions to to wind in Germany at the moment? Yes. Well, you can say that in nearly any project you start, at some point there will rise up some sort of opponent's initiative. Um, this is really something that takes a lot of mm -hmm. time and prolongs um, the timeline um, in many cases. Um, the problem is most people are pro wind energy and but those people who are loud sure. or shouting you are trying who are trying to um yeah spread fake news let's say <laughs> um about uh, wind energy um mm -hmm. it's only a very small group of people well if you if you count it in your own project maybe it's maximum of 10% of the inhabitants of uh, one community and what also happens sure, is uh, sure. this sort of yeah opponents tourism is uh, when they see ah uh, in a maybe fifty kilometers away there is a um, a public a presentation of a wind energy project not only the people from the village come but also those people from from far away so to support um, the opponents the local opponents so this is uh, quite a huge problem but. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, let's say it's you have to, communication um, has a very important role now um, in our projects. So you have to really be open to the people and listen um, to their concerns because you can't go there and just say, I don't care what you think about it. Um, I build a, my wind farm and I don't care. It's not possible. And what we see that um, more and more um, kind of mediators or moderators are taken into the teams or into the yeah are are asked by the mayor yeah to form the, the the process because there needs to be a negotiation right both there's two different sides to the problem or many sides to the problem and and it just takes some leadership to work out all the differences because at the at the end they still have a 2% requirement they must fulfill so they need to fulfill it somehow and trying to fulfill it in the most peaceful way they can does does make a, a lot of sense. It's, we have very similar issues in the United States. In fact, there's one going on right now near in my state, Massachusetts, where we're going to be building offshore wind. And there's, quote unquote, out of state uh, groups that are uh, protesting wind installations offshore in the ocean. And we're going through the same thing. And you're right. It may take two to three years for everything to settle out. And it, it does slow down a project. But hopefully at the end, everybody agrees there are some, there's some, some guidelines here. We're all going to follow these guidelines. And it mm -hmm. may be noise. It may be uh, light blocking or whatever it is that we have to solve. How do you, When you go into these local towns and, and communities, how <laughs> How long do you have to work on that project from start to finish before it gets developed? You must be one of the first people to make contact with the local mayor. How long is that process now from start to finish? Yeah, one of the first things you do in a project in Germany is to talk to, to the mayor, to uh, the community. Um, you present the project uh, for for sure, you also have to talk and make contracts with the landowners, which is um, a second yeah, pillar. And um, it can take, well, it depends. If um, the area is already 
agreed upon by the community. Um, it's not that difficult. It takes some time, but um, then the community does have a, such an active role. Um, but if the community is landlord or landowner herself, um, then it gets, um, yeah, quite, let's say, time uh, demanding. So, because you have to convince the community um, to agree upon the area itself, uh, wind farm itself on their territory and um, to give you uh, the contract. And in many cases, uh, the communities, they yeah do like kind of a tender. It's big pieces of land that uh, communities own. So with one contract, uh, you can maybe realize uh, three wind uh, turbines or five or more. Um, and if you talk to private land or owners, um, you sometimes need five or 10 little pieces and owners for one uh, wind turbine. So this is quite attractive. And if you um, can sign a contract with the community or with the municipality, um, this is also a yes to the project uh, overall. So moving forward, um, you know, where is Germany headed in the next uh, couple of years? And are there any big hurdles? Um, you know, what are, what are you excited about? And where where can we what can we expect from Germany going forward? Well, I'd say any signs are green for us as a as a renewable energy developers. Um, there will be a huge demand for renewable electricity, heat, um, gas, and so on. Um, yeah, Germany has set up a, a huge uh, hydrogen strategy, and um, yeah, lots of subsidies are going into that way. And any big yeah energy company um, is now having pilot projects for hydrogen in combination with uh, renewable energies. They are trying to replace uh, natural gas, for example. But um, yeah, well. <laughs> It's, uh, but we we need um, lots of gas as Germany, and um, yeah, we already know that we ha will have to import huge amounts of green hydrogen from abroad, especially from yeah, well, countries uh, where <laughs> today um, gas or especially oil is coming from. So yeah, countries with uh, loads of sun and wind and um, uh, yeah, lots of empty places, let's say, or empty lands um, where you can build huge uh, renewable energy plants. Yeah. Is Germany going to become energy independent in the near future? Is that one of the goals? Uh, the goal is to be um, decarbonized, so CO2 neutral in uh, 2045. Yeah, there's there's a lot of discussion right now about cross borders of energy production, like like Norway is sending in electricity to the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom sending it back up to to Norway. You know, they're, they're, they're sharing these cables that go, and I think France is doing the same thing to the UK. Uh, but is, is that the sort of the goal European model is that the different countries have different resources and that they're just going to be interconnected at some point, uh, all green, but interconnected? Mm, well, the European grid is strongly interconnected. So um, we exchange electricity with France and the Czech Republic and so on, because, well, this is, let's say, a, a living system. Um, but nevertheless, Germany will have a huge amount of green energy or electricity in the grid. Um, and if I buy um, green electricity, um, as a, a private user, um, of course, it's I pay for green energy that is somewhere um, put into the grid, but maybe I use in my house uh, coal. <laughs> it's a moving target. Huh, that's that's really interesting because I, there's just a there's so many different uh, approaches to trying to solve this renewable energy green uh, economy. 
And Europe is taking a different approach than the U.S. and is taking a different approach from China. Uh, and who knows who's going to be the, the the one that wins out. But everybody, it seems like every country needs to develop their own system. And that, and Germany's system is really interesting because it's 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 in some places markedly different than what's happening in the United States. And I think the United States can learn a lot from the way people like you, Julia, are are moving the renewable energy forward in Germany. And I, that's good. That's just why we're on the podcast, because we all need to learn from one another. The United States isn't always right, for, for goodness sakes. <laughs> that's the thing we, we know, obviously, as Americans, we're sometimes rarely right. But it's good to learn. And I, I really appreciate you being on this podcast, because I, I've learned a, a, a ton of information from you. It's been very valuable. So as we wrap up, uh, I think we both like to hear, are there any big projects on the horizon? And uh, we'd like to hear a, bit, a little bit more about what you're doing with your own podcast. Yeah, I, I guess the biggest uh, project uh, well, that I'm excited about is the, the whole energy transition that um, our country and uh, yeah, Europe and the rest of the world um, are in right now. And I think it's fascinating to see how how much innovation comes from that targeting target um, of our country to be uh, decarbonized in um, two or three decades. Um, this is fantastic. And this matches other big trends that we see in the world, like digitalization, because energy transition isn't possible without digitalization um, or climate justice and so on. So I think this is a fascinating thing to to watch and also to to work on myself um yeah this is so the overall uh, exciting project and yeah well i'm excited uh, because my my own podcast is getting more and more um listeners um yeah it gives me quite yeah quite an audience um quite an impact because my um my design of the podcast is a bit different than yours because I do um, episodes uh, for, let's say, normal people that are interested in the topic of uh, wind energy. And I did this because I get asked the same questions um, since 10 years. So I thought, why don't make a podcast and answer all these questions in a uh, yeah, easily understandable way. And um, yeah, the feedback is really amazing. People say, oh, finally, I understood how a wind tur turbine works or how you find uh, sites or um, how birds can be protected and so on. So this is really, really cool. <laughs> That's great. And yours is, in, yours is in German or in English? Yeah, mine is in German. So yeah. For your listeners, well, some of your listeners who are, who are, are bilingual. In, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, speak German. Um, yeah, it's called Windkanal. Um, so yeah, I think it's in English. It's wind channel. So it's a play on words because channel as yeah, like YouTube or podcast channel, and yeah, wind channel as well in the physical um, dimension. Well, that's terrific. Yeah, it is. It is difficult to I think for like you said the general population to just to get the deep dive into some of these things and learn what they need to learn. And they're curious to learn to help, you know, them feel more comfortable with wind turbine and turbines and these big machines that are maybe going to be in their backyard. That makes a lot of sense that you're kind of getting out in front of it and helping people understand, you know, Hey, that these aren't scary. There's a lot of thought behind this. We're doing what we can to help the environment and protect all the, the creatures that are going to live around it including the community. So yeah, I think that's great. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we will link to Julia's podcast in the show notes, as always. So if you want to check it out, definitely do that. Julia, where else can people find uh, follow up with you and find you on the web? Well, they can find me on the web on my website, www.derwindkanal.de. Um, and yeah, of course, on LinkedIn. So it's Julia minus Wolf minus Wind energy. Well, it's in Germany, uh, in, in German. So wind energy, but not with a Y, but with an IE at the end. <laughs> you can find me there as well. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. It was a great talk and hopefully we'll have you on again in the future. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Have a great day.
Well, again, we want to thank our guest, Julia Wolf. Again, you can follow up with her in the show notes of this podcast. So moving on, the Biden administration and the Department of Energy here in the U.S. are planning to invest $3 billion to strengthen the supply chain for advanced batteries uh, for both energy storage and vehicles here in the U.S. Obviously, electric vehicles are you know shooting through the roof. If you watch the Super Bowl here in the U.S., uh, just recently, you just seen like half the commercials seem to be for you know, electric cars. Um, so, Alan, you know, smart charging is what am I doing? That's the next thing. So, Alan, is this a smart investment on the U.S.'s part in trying to help some of these supply chain woes and, you know, give a little push to battery technology? Well, that's a great question, Dan, because it, it seems like there's a lot of activity in the U.S. on battery development and creating battery factories. Uh, right now in the Midwest, in Kansas, it, it sound, there's a Panasonic is going to build a plant from what it sounds like in the middle of the United States, somewhere in Kansas or Oklahoma. And both of those states are going to this like billion dollar incentive battle uh, to lure Panasonic or whoever the battery maker is to their state. So there, there's already all the 50 states are, it sounds like, pretty aggressive in, in, in having a battery plant because you can think about how many jobs are associated with those. At the same time, I kind of wonder if this is a, a way of the Biden administration sticking it to Elon Musk again, because Elon Musk has been going out there and building his own battery factories. In the meantime, GM and Ford have been relying on others to create batteries. Well, if, if the Biden administration just basically hands $3 billion over to make batteries, well, GM and Ford and Chrysler, Fiat, whatever they call themselves today, will gladly take the batteries that are created out of those out of that $3 billion. In the meanwhile, Musk is doing it by himself. That doesn't seem quite right to me somehow. And, you know, I think it was just this past week where the Biden administration actually said the word Tesla. <laughs> in talking about electric vehicles. For months, they never would never mention Tesla. And they're the number one producer of electric vehicles in the United States. And so for the president to not name them by name felt awkward. And the press would ask him, ask the, the administration about it, and they would just whitewash it. It's like, oh yeah, 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 we know Tesla. We we know that well, we know the company in Texas or whatever whatever the problem. No one's sure what the problem mm -hmm. is there. It's weird. But it's weird, right? It's really weird. Why are we doing this? If we have if we have somebody who is actually making batteries and making electric vehicles and has been, I think you could, in anybody's view, at least slightly successful at it, then why would you not acknowledge them? And then why would you hand over $3 billion in batteries to GM and Ford? That doesn't seem quite right to me. And even though Musk hasn't responded to this particular battery thing, I think he has to say it's good for the economy. It's good for everybody to have more batteries. But internally, I think it's going to be just a grudge match. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why the United States is doing this to itself. Dan, I mean, uh, you've seen all the electric vehicle stuff. We just watched the Super Bowl last night. Do, do, it does seem like there's just like this weird battle between Elon Musk and some of the electric vehicle makers and the administration. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's unfortunate. All $3 billion was spent on Super Bowl ads. <laughs> I don't know what they cost per, <laughs> per, per spot now, but this, this, this grant has already been used up. Um, I'm sure they're Probably, what, yes. 10 million a piece now. Yeah. So good, good job. Good job. We just uh, bought a bunch Fox of ads. Sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think what you said is valid that this is going to really help all the other players catch up where it, that does right. kind of stink for the you know the early innovator who like you said the you know tesla put themselves out there to stand this whole industry up and now everyone else is catching up but then again that's life uh, but rosemary i want to hear from you on the on the energy storage side because it's not just about electric vehicles um i mean how far are we from having the batteries that we need to make energy storage more reliable and really maybe become more more ubiquitous because right now it's it's pretty sparse here in the U.S. and I don't know that it's really that prevalent elsewhere in the in the global economy. 
yeah, so I have been watching what's going on with um, with large scale energy storage, and um, for some of the the consulting projects that I'm working on, I'm trying to figure out which is the right energy storage technology to use. And I will say that it's getting increasingly hard to recommend anything except for lithium ion batteries, um, unless you need a really long duration storage. And then you start to see pumped hydro especially um, be, be more appealing. Um, so I think that the one thing that could get in the way of that is just that there is so much um, so much demand waiting for grid scale batteries once they get just a little bit cheaper, I think, and variable renewables get a little bit more prevalent, then we're going to need this, you know, huge explosion in the amount of energy storage we have. And if that causes supply chain shortages in, you know, a lot of the, the critical minerals, especially, um, plus, you know, all of the, the processing and assembly and everything, then I think we might start to see you know, lithium ion battery prices rise and make some of the alternatives more appealing. But at the moment, it, it, it's really, you know, like I, I really love all of the exciting new energy storage technologies that we've got, um, you know, like, I don't know, compressed air and hydrogen and um, gravity storage. There's all these cool ways to store energy, but I'm never able to actually recommend <laughs> to a client that they, they use one of these exciting technologies because lithium ion batteries for anything, you know, in the range of, you know, even up to a day storage, it's pretty hard to recommend any any other kind of technology. So I think that it's really smart to to intervene and, well, to intervene, but to try and shore up the supply chain to make sure that you're not going to have this, you know, pinch point that will prevent the rollout of um, storage because that's going to be so key to the energy transition. So I, I think it's a good move. Um, the, the, you know, like the philosophy of what they're trying to do is a, a good move at least. All right. Well, while staying with uh, EVs and batteries, the topic of what will happen if everyone five, 10 years from now has an electric vehicle and everyone comes home from work and plugs them into charge at the same time is a concerning one, right? It could essentially overload the grid, cause blackouts. You know, if you have tens of millions of cars trying to charge all at once, uh, so some companies are already on this interesting article by Reuters featured uh, some quotes from the CEO of the British uh, EV charger company called Connected Curb, and that's K-E-R-B. Um, but they've just talked about like, hey, this like the smart charging is absolutely necessary. And by smart charging, they mean you can plug your car in, say, at 4 p.m. after work or 5 p.m. after work, and it won't start actually charging until it senses that, you know, the grid is at a lower lower peak point or um, maybe a, just a cheaper uh, cost of energy. Um, so, Rosemary, that, does that seem like that's a necessary, is, is that as dire of a need as it seems like it, it might be? Yeah, it is it is as dire of a need. Um, there's no way that we're going to have like massive rollout of electric vehicles and not coordinate the charging in some way. That's just not possible. But what I think that gets missed a lot is that it's not just a need. It's also, it's not just avoiding a problem with rolling out EVs. It's a massive opportunity and a way to really improve the, the grid by having this controllable load, a large controllable load. Because grids already do that to a certain extent. Like if you've got an aluminium smelter on your grid, then that often uses up to, you know, in um, New South Wales, I think they've got a smelter that uses 10% of the um, the state's electricity. And large industrial users like that already always have agreements where they will be told in, you know, periods of, of challenging periods for the grid to reduce their load a certain amount. But EV charging is so much more flexible. You know, you can vary from zero to 100, whereas a smelter can only, you know, maybe take 10 or uh, a, a bit more for modern um, smelters, but you can see that there's this massive opportunity to match um, the demand now to the supply. So when there's just a ton of wind blowing overnight, now all these cars will turn on, start charging, and then they've got these, the yeah, they, they've got something to do with all that electricity that would have had to be wasted before. And then you can take it a step further and um, make the two-way, the bi-directional charger smarter than smart charging, actually get to um, vehicle to, to grid charging, where you can then tap into some of the extra capacity in the batteries 
when their grid is stressed. So there's just so much opportunity. And I think the next decade will be about figuring out how to take advantage of these like in principle um, advantages, how to figure out the actual mechanics of how it's going to work, the economic incentives that's going to be needed to get um, customers to want to participate in that um, and, and figure it all out. Because it's not just a smart charger that you need, you're going to need a smart grid as a whole to know which bits of the grid are stressed, where should you be taking more power. But I mean, the potential is so huge that I, I am, I'm so sure that this is going to happen, but we're just in the, yeah, we're really complicated phase at the moment trying to figure out the, the details and the mechanics of it. But I'm really excited about this technology. I think the infrastructure in a lot of countries, the electrical grids are ancient. They're r- roughly 100 years old. And it's going to be very hard to upgrade them quickly. And we're going to have to do some sort of metering devices in the short term. But it's going to be problematic. I don't know how if we really are going to push electric vehicles as quickly as we are and electrify a significant part of uh, of industry, which is what we'll have to do is electrify it, some portion of it. And then it gets really hard to, to sort of maintain the grid because there's only there's this. If you think about the United States, it's got to be hundreds of thousands of miles or millions of miles of of cable, copper, <laughs> transmission towers and uh, substations and the whole thing. It's going to be really hard to do that. And uh, I just know Americans well enough that not having power for any extended period of time is going to be problematic. And Americans are going to try to find a way around that, uh, either becoming energy independent individually by hooking up solar panels or something of the sort so they can power their electric vehicle. That's very possible or finding ways to work around the system, which Americans are well known for. (laughs) So I could see a day where hacking into someone else's vehicle to charge your vehicle is a thing. I can see that happening now, actually, Uh, just because uh, if you make energy uh, limited, you'll find ways around that system. And, And we're about to embroach on that. And we haven't been in that mode for probably 50 plus years uh, and it, it, it's the world is coming more and more electrified and we have to have the infrastructures to support it. We just don't. We just don't right now. And it's going to be a problem going forward for sure. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Uptime Wind Energy podcast. Again, we want to thank our guest, Julia Wolf. Be sure to follow up with her. You'll find information in the show notes uh, or description of this podcast, wherever you listen or watch. And be sure to subscribe to the show, share it with a friend, and we will see you here next week on Uptime. Operating a profitable wind farm is all about mitigating costs, minimizing risks, and being efficient with maintenance, repairs, and upgrades. It's incredibly expensive to send a team of rope access technicians up tower to make even simple repairs. We also know how costly lightning damage can be, requiring inspection, repairs, and downtime for even minor lightning strikes. This is why it just makes sense to install a WeatherGuard Strike Tape LPS upgrade the next time your technicians are going up tower. Maximize the time efficiency of your techs and prevent future lightning damage by installing our Strike Tape LPS upgrade the next time your crews are going up on ropes. Learn more in today's show notes or visit us on the web at weatherguardwind.com.